One of the difficult and stunning revelations of life is that that day when you learn that life is not all about you. It's kind of one of those awkward moments when you think everybody in this world exists to make you happy and to make you joyful, and, and you can't believe they don't agree with you on something, and, they, and, and you can't believe that they're making your life miserable. In fact, you think it's getting worse, and, and you're not quite sure what you need to say to convince them that they exist for you, and, and we don't like that, and, and the problem is we never quite seem to learn that lesson. We grow up as kids believing that everything's about us, and, can't, you know, and that's why we whine. We don't get our way, but some of us haven't quite moved past that yet, right? We keep whining because we're not getting our way, and we don't understand why everybody else doesn't see it that way. But have you ever considered the fact that perhaps God has ordained something for us because there is something greater than us? God has ordained something for us because there is something greater than us. Our lives are not about ourselves. Our lives are not about what we can get and what we can have and what we can maintain and what we can promote and what we can build. Our lives are about something bigger. One of the questions that we all have to wrestle with is, what is success? What does success really look like? And how will we know when we get there? Most of us have some idea of that, the number of people that, that work for us. Is some for some people that's a measure of success they have they have been promoted their way up through the business up through the company until they you know they started down in the mail room and now they're a they're a they're a manager or, or vice president and we measure success by the people under us who are now working for us who let's face it they exist to make our lives better right they exist to make us look good and that's what we want from them for some people success is measured in in dollars or the size of a house, or the behavior of children, or the success or size or place of our vacations. There's all kinds of different definitions for success. But have you ever thought about the fact that maybe success means growing down? Come back to the book of John this morning and talk about a guy for whom life was not about him. In fact, success for John the Baptist would have been what most people consider a failure. I am a pastor, all right? I stand up and preach on Sundays, and one thing I really appreciate is when you show up. It gives me somebody to preach to. On occasion during the week, I'll come in here and kind of preach to nobody, try a few things out, see how it sounds. But then people show up, and, and, and for every pastor, I'm telling you, you know, I don't, maybe I shouldn't, but I'll just tell you, for every pastor, there is a certain amount of, of something in us that, that ties our success to the number of people out here who show up to listen to us. And, and, and if you doubt that, become a pastor and understand that the number one question people are going to ask you when they find out you're a pastor, how big is your church? I hate that question. I'm, I, I, I always have. You know, I, I think, well, my church is about, I don't know, 10,000 square feet. That's not the question they're asking, is it? What do they want to know? How many people come and listen to you every week? Because that is the measure of success. But here comes this guy, John the Baptist, who is a preacher, and his whole job is to have nobody listening to him. Can you imagine that? You know, again, here we are as, as a church, and, and we start seeing people who go to another church. We're like, why, why are you going over there? And, and we make phone calls and, 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 and appeals to them and ask them out for coffee and try to, hey, why are you going over there? Why don't you come in? Because for us as a church, oftentimes, it's a failure if people go listen to somebody else. But again, for John the Baptist, it was a success when people went to listen to somebody else. I want to ask you this morning, what does success look like for you? When we come back to John chapter 3 here, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. That's that southern part 
of Jerusalem, of, of Palestine, where Jerusalem has been. In fact, I'm going to put a map up on the screen so you can see it up there. And uh, look, and you'll see down in the southern part, uh, that kind of greenish area is Judea. That is the place where Jesus was ministering at this point in his ministry. And, and he's there, and his disciples are in the land of Judea with them, and he was spending time with them and baptizing. I want you to think here for a moment. From the very beginning, Jesus knew what his task was. Remember, Jesus knew he came to die. And, and from the moment he began his public ministry, he knew it was going to be about three to three and a half years until he was going to die. But his job wasn't done because Jesus didn't just come to die, he came to build a church. But in order to build that church, he needed some followers. He needed some disciples that he could teach them. And you know how he taught them? He spent time with them. I have a friend of mine, he's a missionary, he said discipleship is spelled T-I-M-E. You got to spend time with people. We know this, right? Uh, we tell our kids, uh, be careful who you hang around. In fact, we might even tell them, no, that kid is not coming over our house to spend the afternoon because he's a bad influence on you. You know why we say it? Because every single one of us understands discipleship. That kid who is the bad influence is a disciple maker. He's teaching. When Jesus went to make disciples, he had to spend time with them. And he does it by teaching them, by, by being with them, by sending them out to try it on their own. And when they come back, sometimes they come back with failures. There's that story in the Gospels where the disciples go out and, and try to cast out a demon and it doesn't work. And that's one of those awkward miracle-working moments where you do your big thing and all of a sudden it just falls totally flat. And, and then Jesus comes along and, and Jesus casts out the demon. And his disciples say, Lord, why could we not do that? We fell flat on our face. You see, in the process of disciple making. Jesus knew he had to spend time with them. Jesus knew he had to teach them because that is how the church was going to be furthered and built. And, and by the way, let me just tell you this today. We are here in 2018 because of 2,000 years of this. The followers of Jesus spent time with people and taught them what Jesus had taught them. And, and though that generation spent time with people and taught them what Jesus had taught them. And, and and it went on for 2,000 years. That is 2 Timothy chapter 2 when Paul says, The things that you have heard from me, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And year after year after year, disciples are made by spending time. Some of you think you can be a disciple of Jesus because you show up at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning and stay here until 12 or 12.30 or whatever it happens to be when I get done. And, and, and you can go home and you can check your church box off. Say, I'm a disciple of Jesus because I went to church. And listen, I want you in church. I'm a pastor. I want you here. I just said that, right? All right? But understand that you can't follow Jesus simply by listening to me for an hour or an hour and a half a week. It takes time, time spent with people. That's why we as a church or a group of people are supposed to be doing life together during the week. Ha hanging out and, and, and phone calls and conversations and encouragements and texts and emails or however it is for you. you got to spend time with people if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus. You have to spend time with people who are following Jesus. There's also a man named John, verse number 23. John was baptizing in Anon near Salim. Now, let's put the map back up there for just a second, kind of show you where this is. We're not entirely sure, but just to give you an idea of, of what it is, if you look about halfway up over near the Jordan River, there's that place called Tel Salim. A tel was, was kind of a mound in, in ancient times in the Middle East as, as cities uh, uh, got destroyed and then they would build on top of them. You have these tells that are like mounds and one of the ways they do archaeology is dig down through these tells until they can find, you know, various layers of the city and various layers of the generations that have passed. That's what a tell is. You see the word Anon there, and there's a question mark after it because we're not entirely sure where it is. They think this is, the word Anon means something like springs. There are springs of water there. Now, if you go back to verse number 23 and look at that, John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. 
There are springs there. There's much water. Now, let me ask you a question. All right. Why did he need much water to baptize people? All right. My answer to that probably won't surprise you. I'm a Baptist. If you're going to baptize somebody, it takes a fair amount of water because you've got to get them all the way under and all the way back up in most cases. Don't hold them down there too long. But it takes a lot of water to baptize people. All right. it, it was not simply in the, in the New Testament. The word baptize actually means to dip or to immerse. Uh, sometimes today, and this is one of those church traditions, it's not necessarily something that keeps you out of heaven, okay? Um, but, but there are some church traditions who believe that baptism can be done by sprinkling or by pouring, called effusion. All right. Here, here's the thing, uh, is there is a word in the New Testament for sprinkling. There is a word in the New Testament for pouring. They are never used of Christian baptism. The word that is used of Christian baptism is the word baptize. That's actually the word, baptizo, if you're in the Greek. Baptize. It sounds just like a baptizo. Baptismos is the noun form of it. You hear the word baptism in there? It means to dip or to immerse. Now, now I would just say, by the way, that, that the reason why they need a lot of water is because they were actually baptizing people by immersion. In fact, uh, just a little Baptist lesson uh, to baptize is by immersion. When you baptize by immersion, you're being redundant. It's just to say the same thing over again. Now, here's what John was doing. John was baptizing people at this place because there was enough water there to do it. And people were coming to him and being baptized because they heard John's message. They, they responded to John's message. And John's baptism was what we call a baptism of repentance, a baptism that was a symbol of the repentance from their sin. Now, remember, one of the teachings of Scripture is that sin is disobedience to God, but it's not just some kind of nebulous, ethereal, spiritual thing. There is an actual corrupting influence on our lives, a moral corruption. And that moral corruption requires cleansing. That baptism of repentance was probably the symbolism of being cleansed from the spiritual corruption of sin. When somebody came to John to get baptized, they were turning from their sin and turning to God. It's a little bit different than Christian baptism. Now, the baptism is the same. The baptism is immersion, but the symbolism is different. John's was a baptism of repentance. Christian baptism is a baptism of identification with Christ. We have been buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too should walk in newness of life. There is a baptism of identification that today in Christian baptism, and by the way, we have a baptism coming up in a couple of weeks. In Christian baptism, somebody is buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. By the way, you can't do that with sprinkling. The whole symbol of it is that burial and resurrection. Now, here's the point that's going on in this passage, is there are these baptisms. Jesus is baptizing some people through his disciples. Chapter 4, verse 2 says Jesus himself wasn't actually doing the baptism, but it was Jesus through his disciples teaching them to baptize. And so you have Jesus baptizing people, you have John baptizing people. And, and that has the potential, as you might imagine, to create some confusion. So what happens out of that? John's disciples, in verse number 25, start having this discussion with a Jew about purification. Now we've just added one more thing in the mix. You with me still? All right, you have Jesus' baptism, you have John's baptism, and now you have this Jew with some questions about purification. If you go back to the Old Testament, under Old Testament law, you had the series of ritual washings, these series of, of cleansing acts that were in obedience to the law. One of the places you see this is in the New Testament. Remember when Jesus' disciples go through and eat grain and corn, and, and the Pharisees complain because your disciples didn't wash their hands. Remember that? Um, they were not concerned about cleanliness. That, that was not a hygienic kind of, you didn't use soap to wash your hands before you eat. It was a ritual washing, a ritual pur purification they were concerned about. So now you have uh, uh, Jews who have grown up in their system of Judaism with these ritual washings. Then you have John's baptism of repentance, and you have Jesus' baptism, and you have some confusion. What in the world is going on here? And so this Jew comes to, to John's disciples, and they talk about this. And you know what John's disciples told them? I don't either. You know why? <laughs> because John the apostle doesn't tell us what the outcome of that conversation was. But it actually sparked another thought. 
Now put yourself in the case of John's disciples. You have devoted yourself to following John the Baptist. You have spent time with him. You have taught and preached alongside of him. You have invited people. Come and listen to this guy. Come and hear what he says. Come and respond to what he says. And, and, and then all of a sudden, your crowds start getting a little bit smaller. And, and you're like, where did I go? Is this like summer? Everybody goes up north? To like Galilee or wherever you go when you're in Palestine? I don't know. Is this, is this vacation time? Is this, what, what's going on? And then along the way, you find out that this other guy over here named Jesus, they're all going to listen to him. And so they go to John in verse number 26, and they say, Rabbi, teacher, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, probably speaking there of his baptism, the guy that you baptized, the guy that you were telling us about, he's baptizing, he's cutting in on our business. He's taking our crowd. All the people are going to him. Now, that's probably hyperbole. How do we know that not all the people were going to Jesus? Well, we know that several ways. One, because John's disciples were still talking to John. So all of them hadn't gone because you're still here. And, and that Jew was still there listening to John. It's probably hyperbole. It's kind of like we say, man, everybody goes there. Everybody does that. Or, or maybe it's like Yogi Berra. You know who Yogi Berra was? The guy who, who said all kinds of funny things. One of the things he said, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. All right, so everybody's going over there. What were they concerned about? We're failing. We're losing. We've been trying to teach these people. We've been trying to get this crowd of people to come and, 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 and listen to God and listen to preaching and, and believe in Jesus. And, and now they're going over there to listen to Jesus. We're failing. What's John's answer? Verse number 27. A man can receive nothing except it has been given him from heaven. This is probably a proverbial type of statement. Probably just a general, hey, why do you have what you have? The answer is because God gave it to you. He gives us life and breath and all things. It's just kind of a common thing. We all know that, that everything we have comes from God. So here's John's point. Listen, that crowd I had, where did I get that crowd from? I got it from God. And everything I have comes from God. I have nothing else. You yourselves are, are my witnesses. I said I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent ahead of him. Remember, I told you this was my job. My job was not to get a bunch of followers to me. My job was to point people, go over there. My job was not to get a bunch of people to believe I'm a great speaker. My job was to get a bunch of people to go over there and follow Jesus. And what you think is failure is what I think is success. What you think of as, as failing is what God called me to do. God called me to, to dwindle my crowd down until there's nobody left because they all went over there and followed Jesus. That was my job. That's what I did. This is the greatest thing in the world. In fact, it's kind of like a wedding. I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. And, and that'd be probably the equivalent today of our best man. The best man is not supposed to be the show of the wedding. He's supposed to stand there and, and be quiet and make sure the rings are in the right place and make sure everybody's got everything done right. And, and he's rejoicing for the groom. I mean, I don't think a lot of best men are, are really happy. Like, oh, yes, I get to be the best man. This is great. That, that's not the point. The point is, I get to serve this, this groom. I get to celebrate and rejoice with him. And that's why John said, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. Jesus is the one that matters. And I rejoice not because I showed up. I rejoice not because I have a big crowd. But I am happy because God in Christ has been magnified. My joy is full. He must increase, and I must decrease. Think about that for a moment. I challenge you this morning. Think about that. What does it mean for you? He must increase. That is a strong word. It's a word of obligation. It's a word of necessity. It's not a word of idealism in an ideal world. It's not a word of idealism. It's not a word of dreaming. It's a word of absolute necessity. He must increase. I must decrease. 
This was the determined will of God. And for John the Baptist, this wasn't some kind of begrudging resignation to reality. Yeah, we're kind of we're kind of winding it down here. Yeah, things are slowing down for us. You know, I wish we had a big crowd, but at least they're going somewhere. That wasn't it. For John, this was an absolute necessity that brought joy to him. For John the Baptist to have wished he were someone else. For John the Baptist to have wished he had been called to serve in a more prominent way would have been covetousness. He would have been seeking something that was never his to begin with. He would have been seeking the, su the supremacy that belonged to Christ alone. He would have been guilty of unbelief. How so? Because he would not have believed that Jesus was the highest and best. He would have been seeking something else. You see, when John the Baptist became convinced that Jesus was the highest and best, everything he did was to point to Jesus. Everything he did was to exalt Jesus. And everything about himself was, I'm going to get smaller. I'm going to decrease. My crowds are going to go down. Eventually, I'm not going to have a crowd anymore because they're all going to be over there, and that's going to be the greatest thing in the world. He must increase. Why is it that Jesus must increase? Why was John so convinced of this? Well, I want to show you four reasons from the text this morning. Verse number 31, the first one is right here. He who comes from above is above all. He who is from the earth, he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. The first reason Jesus must increase is because of where he's from. He came from God in heaven. He was not merely human. John the Baptist was merely human. <laughs> Among men, there's no one greater, but he was still merely human. Jesus must increase because he actually came from heaven. He, God of God, divine from eternity past, having all of the essence and the attributes of God, became man and descended to earth. He who was rich for your sake became poor. Jesus must increase because of where he is from. He is from heaven. Don't you dare underestimate what that means. Don't, don't, don't minimize Jesus down to some kind of divine messenger, some kind of angelic being. No, no, no. He is God. He came from heaven. He came to this earth and took human flesh. He did not consider that equality with God as something to be held on to, but he emptied himself. He became a man. He became a servant. And because he came from heaven, he must increase. But it's not just that he came from heaven, not just where he's from. It's the message that he has. Look, verse number 32. What he has seen and heard, speaking of Jesus there, of that he testifies. When Jesus came to earth, he did not receive a message from somebody else. Where did John's message come from? John's message came from heaven. Jesus brought that message with him. He had the message in himself. He had the words of God. The things which he had seen and heard, that's what he talks about. John had never seen and heard heaven. John was only a secondhand repeater of what he had heard. Jesus had been there. Jesus had been there at the beginning of creation. And he brings that message to us. He brings that message to humanity. And yet no one receives his testimony. He, he, was, he was rejected. In, in the words of John chapter 1 from a few chapters ago and a few months ago now, in the words of chapter 1, he came unto his own and his own did not receive him. Many people in that day heard the message of Jesus and, and walked away. 
Many people in the early in the early days of his ministry, Jesus was having huge crowds and and people following him. And, and yet, the longer it went through Jesus' life, it seems like the smaller his crowds got. Even on the night of his betrayal, eleven disciples they all fled. Step one. They all thought, why? The longer it went, they, they apparently started to question. Started to doubt a little bit. Started to wonder. And yet there were some who, who did receive His testimony. Again, that no one received His testimony. is kind of that hyper, hyper, hyperbole, that hyperbolic statement. Everybody, nobody well, not exactly, but, but as a general rule, people didn't receive his testimony. But there were some who did. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Because God was the one who came. See, here, here was a thing in, in first century Judaism. When people came to Jesus, and you see this in John 8, we'll get there eventually. When, when the Pharisees, oh, yeah, yeah, we're, we're sons of Abraham. We're believers in God. And Jesus said, no, 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 you're not either. If you believe God, you would accept me. If you deny me, Jesus says, it's because you don't actually believe God. You see, here's the thing. You can't have it both ways. There are some people, well, I believe in God. I don't believe in Jesus. Well, then you don't believe in God because God is the one who sent Jesus. Jesus is God. And when you receive the testimony of Jesus, you are setting your seal, your approval. You are affirming that God is true. Because that's where the message comes from. Jesus must increase because of the message he has. It is a supreme message. It is a truthful message. It is a message of divine revelation. Do not doubt it. Jesus also must increase because of the hope that he alone offers. Verse number 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Actually, this morning, where else are you going to get that from? He who believes in the Son, he who believes this message, this, this Jesus who came to speak the words of God, he gives eternal life. And if you believe him, he will give you that eternal life. Where else will you get that from? When people began to fall away from Jesus in John chapter 6, he fed 5,000 people. What an amazing story that is. And, and, and then they begin to fall away because, hey, wait, we want a king right now. You know, this, this spiritual delayed kingdom stuff, we want it right now. And they begin to fall away because of these hard words of Jesus. And Jesus turns to the disciples and he says to them, will you also go away? And Peter says, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. There is life nowhere else. Acts chapter 4, the message of the very church, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. If you're going to have life, it's going to come through Jesus. But in order to have that, you're going to have to recognize who He is. Who He is and what He's done. Jesus must increase because He is the only way of eternal life. There is no other way. But the flip side of that is reason number four, Jesus must increase because of the judgment that he alone can save from. Verse number 36 again, he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Jesus must increase because of the judgment that he will save from. Right now, everybody who does not believe in Jesus who has not come to Jesus for salvation, and by believe there, by the way, remember, by believe, I don't, I don't mean you simply acknowledge that one day he existed. I, I, belief is not simply saying, oh yeah, I, I know he lived, I know he died, you know he rose from the dead. To believe in Jesus is to rest fully on him. The Bible uses the terms repent and believe. Turn from your sin and yourself and your, and your self-efforts and come to Jesus. That's the only way to have eternal life. And if you have not done that, I want you to see your state in the text this morning. I want, I, want to, I want you to see where you're at. He who does not obey the Son. Why does it use the word obey there? The, the word is an interesting one. It's a word that has to do with persuasion. Someone who has not been persuaded enough to follow him. 
and obedience. That's what it means. It means you, you might assent to some facts that you believe this historical Jesus lived. You might believe that Jesus died on the cross. You might believe he rose again from the dead. But have you been persuaded that you should be following him with your life? That's the point. And if you don't obey him, you haven't been persuaded yet. You know, if you say, oh, I know, I know. No, you don't know if you don't do it. And, and, and so here he comes and he says, if you do not obey the Son, you will not see light, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God abides on him. Now, you hear that term, wrath of God, instantly some of you are like, whoa, whoa, I thought God was a God of love. He is. Absolutely. He loved the world and sent his Son. But he's also a God of wrath. What is God's wrath? God's wrath is not like your wrath or my wrath. It's not this moment, this flash of anger when somebody does something, you just blow up and explode and, and you start yelling, screaming and throwing things or hitting things or, or whatever it is you do when you get angry. That's not God's wrath. God's wrath is his settled opposition to sin. God's wrath is not an explosive, out-of-control anger. God's wrath is perfectly un in control. That's why it hasn't come yet in its full sense of judgment. But here's what I want you to see, is if you have not received Christ, it's not that one day you will be under God's wrath. You already are. You see, there's only two states. You're either in God's family or you're under God's wrath. You either have eternal life or you have eternal death. There's no middle category. Sometimes we think, well, I'm still considering. But, but those who are considering, those who are thinking about it, are those who have not yet received it. And some of you are there today. Like, yeah, I've been coming for a while. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of thinking about this thing. I'm kind of trying to figure out who Jesus is. Here's who he is. He is the one who came from heaven. He is the one who speaks the words of God to you. He is the one who gives you eternal life. And he's the one who saves you from the wrath of God. And some of you, you need to cross that line. And I beg you, in the words of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I beg you on behalf of God, be reconciled. Come in faith. I don't know where you're at with that this morning. But if you're considering, if you're thinking about it, if you're like, eh, I'm trying to decide what I want to do, you're under God's wrath. And I say that this morning not to put you down. I say that this morning to encourage you. There is a sense of urgency to this. The wrath of God is real. It abides on him who does not believe. Jesus must increase because of where he came from, because of what he says, because of the life he gives and because of the wrath he saves us from. But I ask you this morning, what does it mean for you to Jesus? What does it mean to you for Jesus to increase? Many of you think of Jesus as a sort of rising tide. Remember that statement, a rising tide lifts all boats. Hey, I'm good for Jesus to, to lift, <laughs> to increase so long as I get to go with him. Let's just kind of move up together through this thing. We're all about Jesus increasing, but what happens when the increase of Jesus and the, and the exaltation of Jesus and the magnifying of Jesus costs you something? I don't know what that means for you. Can I suggest a few things this morning just to start your thinking? Thank you. I'm going to. What if your commitments to Christ and His church to the increase of Jesus it means you don't take that promotion at work because of what it'll mean for your church life. What if, what, if, what if that pursuit of extra whatever it is means that's going to take me away from serving Christ in His church? I want church, I want Jesus to be magnified in church, but, but I want myself to... What happens if you don't live in as big a house as you might like because of your financial priorities in, in serving the mission of Jesus in his church? You okay with that? What happens when your child believes they've been called by God to be a missionary in some far off country and they take your grandchildren with them? Years ago, I, mom came to him, her son was about eight at the time, and his mom said, my son thinks he's been called to be a missionary. Oh, that's great. 
It's like, I'm not sure. I don't want him to go that far away. What happens when it starts costing us something? What happens when, when you come to church and, and Jesus is exalted through the preaching and, and through the singing and, and yet you don't get quite the feeling you thought you should get out of it? Is that okay with you? Is it okay if, if, if maybe the message isn't quite hitting you right with the kind of feel goods you want it to hit you with? Is that okay? What if the increase of Jesus involves personal sacrifice? I am convinced that some of God's choicest and most faithful servants are people whose names will never be known. Who went, as someone once said, to preach the gospel, to die and be forgotten. And nobody knows who they are. But somewhere scattered across the globe is a skeleton of somebody who went and died there for the sake of Jesus. Who left home and everything for that. These are people who, in the words of Hebrews, men of whom this world was not worthy because they fulfilled the increase of Jesus at personal sacrifice. What happens if the increase of Jesus means you don't get what you want? What if the increase of Jesus involves personal pain? When Paul was, was in prison, he was suffering. He said, I rejoice because Christ is being preached. And, and if, if me being in prison means Christ is magnified, <laughs> leave me here. For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. What, what, if, what, if, what if the increase of Christ involves personal pain like, like that thorn in the flesh Paul had? There was given to me a thorn in the flesh lest I become too proud. And, and I prayed three times, God take it away. And God said, no. My grace is sufficient. And what does Paul say? All right, I'll deal with it. No. You remember the passage, right? Most, most gladly I will glory in my pain so that the power of Christ may rest on me. What if the increase of Jesus involves discomfort or personal pain? What if it involves death? You know, for, for us personally, if it involves death, we're kind of in heaven. You know, to die is gain. But most of us probably are not ready quite to leave our families yet. Right? You guys still got some unfinished work to do. We're not dying to die. We'd like to put that off as long as possible. But what if in God's providence, the increase of Christ means that I don't get what I want? Will we judge Jesus by our own personal success? For John, the increase of Jesus meant his crowd got smaller and smaller. For John, the increase of Jesus meant he was going to end up in prison. For John, the increase of Jesus meant his head was going to end up on a platter. You okay with that? Oh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Because that's not really a problem for us, right? Most of us are not worried that we're going to leave here today and be, be put in prison because we showed up at church this morning. It's even less likely that your head's going to end up on a platter by midweek because some king in some place had his daughter dance and impress some guys and decided he'd need to reward her with something and, and ends up it's going to be your head. That's what happened to John the Baptist. See, for most of us, the increase of Jesus are the things that are much more personal to us. We're, we're, we're fine with all these far-out scenarios. Yeah, if, if I got put in prison for, for preaching the gospel, I'm okay with that. But what happens if you lose friends over it? Or what happens if it changes your schedule a little bit and you don't quite get to do the things you want? Will we judge Jesus by our own personal success? We are so tempted to judge the increase of Jesus by whether or not we feel better or experience something or, or get better. Jesus kind of becomes the magic genie. And here's what I want to say to you this morning. This life is about Christ. And if we go and we die and we are forgotten, it's okay if Christ was magnified. And if you go on to be the richest, most famous person in the whole globe, and Jesus is not magnified, it's a waste. He 
must increase. My heart for Evangel Baptist Church is that this become a church where Jesus increases. Where His fame is greater and bigger and His glory is, most, is more beautifully seen. Because we have devoted ourselves not to, to the pursuit of our increase, but to the pursuit of Him. Some of you this morning, you need to start with verse 36. He who believes in the Son. Jesus needs to increase in your life by you coming to faith in Him this morning. You need to cross that line and say, Jesus, I'm coming. You are my only hope. i got nothing else. I'm coming to you. I've got no other hope for eternal life. I'm coming to you. Do that this morning. We'd love to talk to you about that. We'd love to, to have a discussion and, and talk to you about the Scriptures this morning. Come to Christ. Perhaps you're here this morning and, and you're wrestling with, with personal success and, and the call of the gospel on your life. You're one of those who say, yeah, I'm all about Jesus increasing. Just don't, just don't let it cost me anything. And listen, I don't know what God's doing in your life. I, I don't know what the cost might be for you. Sometimes I, I have a feeling I know what it is for me. <laughs> and honestly, I'm not always that, that comfortable about that. I go, really? Don't we have another option? But if Jesus increases, what other option do I need? Some of you this morning, maybe you're holding on to something. You're like, you, you need to get rid of it. You need to let go of it and say, Jesus, I'm okay decreasing so long as you increase. As we close this morning. Our musicians are going to come. And uh, we're going to sing this song, All Glory Be to Christ. And there's this, this line in there, if, if nothing of our legacy survives, is that okay with you? If we live the gospel and then die and be forgotten, is that okay if Jesus is made greater and stronger in our eyes and the eyes of those around us? He must increase. I, you, we must decrease. Let's pray together. Father, this morning in the name of Jesus we come. We have no other hope. We want him to increase, whether by life or by death. We wanted to see His name magnified. And so, Father, this morning, would you do that work in our lives? Pry our fingers loose from the things that we would hold on to. Glorify Jesus among us because of where He came from, because of what He said, because of the hope He gives, and because of the judgment He spares us from. There are those here this morning who need to cross that line of faith this morning. Bring them to you. Open their eyes that they may see the glory of Christ and embrace Him who died for them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.